Hello and welcome to GameSack. Let's check out every single game that's compatible with the arcade card. Now you might be asking, what is the arcade card? Well, the TurboGrafx and PC Engine CD-ROM require a system card to run games off of CD. Later, in 1991, the Super System Card was introduced that increased the RAM to 256 kilobits or 2 megabits. This really helped out with games on the platform. The Duo consoles have this extra memory built in. In 1994, the Arcade card was released, which offers 16 megabits of RAM on top of the existing 2 megabits. Duo owners could opt for the Arcade Card Duo, but non-Duo owners would need the Arcade Card Pro, which has all 18 of the needed megabits. The Arcade Card Pro can work on Duo consoles as well. Now, all games compatible with the Arcade Card never left Japan since the TurboGrafx CD and the Duo were completely done in North America by then anyway. So, let's get this started. First up is 3x3Eyes from Nihon Create and NEC. This one is basically a digital comic based on the manga. It follows the story of Yakumo, who is immortal, and he must protect a three-eyed girl named Pai. She's seeking to become human. If she dies before that, so does Yakumo, because of course. Naturally, the entire game is in Japanese, and if you didn't know any better, you might think this is a supernatural dating sim at first. Everything starts out very normally and day-to-day-ish, with only a hint of otherworldly stuff going on here and there. You could probably stumble your way through this one just by selecting all of the options a few times, as one tends to do in such games, but you'll enjoy it much more if you can read it. So I recommend learning Japanese at least an hour or so before you boot this one up. This one uses the arcade card optionally, but it does require at least a Super System card or a Duo console. Here's what you get if you don't have that. The game itself plays exactly the same with either the Super System or arcade card. But if you have the arcade card, you get a bit more animation in some of the many cutscenes. What's more is that with the Super System card, the animation has to be loaded in chunks, so you get chiptune music. With the arcade card, the cutscenes have actual CD audio since everything can be loaded into its massive RAM. <laughs> it's only this way for the cutscenes, though. You'll also get an occasional loading screen like this if you use an arcade card. Overall, I feel this one would be pretty fun if it were in English, and it's definitely improved with the arcade card. Here's Asuka 120% Maxima Burning Fest. This is a one-on-one -on -one fighter. The game revolves around anime girls, which you'll find is a theme for some reason in this episode. It's a kind of clunky fighting game, and sadly, it doesn't seem to use a six-button controller. Saying that, the gameplay is decent, if a bit unspectacular. I really like the music, though. The arcade card is optional, and it's a little weird. It'll completely ignore the arcade card unless you hold left on the D-pad and button 2 when you press run at the system card screen. Then it checks for the arcade card. After that, it asks you if you'd like to use it. I mean, duh. If you choose yes by pressing button 1, it then loads a bunch of data. I wonder why they hide it like this. That's so weird. Anyway, using the arcade card results in much shorter load times between each match, about 2 seconds or so. Everything else is the same. If you use a System 2.0 card, you get that same screen, but it tells you that System 2 isn't supported and that you need to use either a Super System or Arcade card. I'm guessing you can only reach 120% maxima if you use an Arcade card. You probably only get 36% minima if you don't. Sorry, yeah, I know that was bad. <laughs> This is The Atlas Renaissance Voyager from ArtDink. This is a strategy slash simulation game, which of course I have no chance of figuring out here. It was ported from the PC and also made it to the Super Famicom. It's compatible with the Memory Base 128, a special save device powered by AA batteries that sits between the console and the controller. It's also compatible with the PC Engine mouse. The arcade card is optional, and I can tell you that the gameplay seems exactly the same with both cards. The main difference is that, like 3x3Eyes, this one can load more data into RAM at once so you get CD music as you play. 
Without the arcade cart, it needs to load little bits of data frequently so you get PSG music instead. The best thing about this one is when you try to use a System 2.0 card. There might be some fun hidden here somewhere, but this isn't something I want to mess around long enough to find out. Here's Brandish by Falcom and NEC. This game is weird, and it takes a lot of getting used to. It's an overhead adventure game, and at first the control will throw you off. You press up and down to move forwards and backwards. If you press left or right, the screen rotates as you face that way. So basically it almost controls like you're in first person mode, even though you have a top down view. If you hold the one button, you can strafe left or right without rotating the screen, and you can hop if you move forward. Even opening chests, pulling levers, entering doors, and reading signs is a challenge. Basically, you need to stand in front of the item that you want to interact with, press and hold the two button, and then press down on the D-pad. Attacking seems like it should be straightforward by hammering on the two button, but you need to keep the enemies at a distance. You can use the mouse in this one, but I don't have one to try out. The game movement is rather choppy, and it takes some getting used to. Still, the game starts becoming oddly kind of fun once you do get the hang of it. The map at the bottom makes you want to progress to the areas you haven't been to and see what's there. The arcade card is optional in this one, and from what I can tell, it adds exactly nothing. Maybe a load time here or there was sped up or even emitted, but the difference isn't very noticeable. If you use a System 2.0 card, you get this glitchy looking screen that has a voice telling you about your mistake. Overall, this certainly isn't one of Falcom's best, but it's fun to try. Next is Icon Wa Kamini from Art Dink. It's also compatible with the mouse and the Memory Base 128. This is a baseball management simulator. Pretty exciting. And by that I mean it's incomprehensible. Honestly, I saw absolutely no difference as I played with or without the optional arcade card. The only thing that showed up is this screen telling you to be patient while it loads data to the arcade card. If you try to play the game with a System 2.0 card, you get the same title screen music, just with a black screen. This is definitely not my type of game in any language. Thankfully, this is the last Art Dink game I need to play today. This is Emerald Dragon from NEC. This is a role-playing game starring a dragon with hair who seems to have a relationship with a human lady. I've read posts from people saying that this one uses the arcade card optionally to enhance it, but the arcade card logo is nowhere on the packaging. This was also released at the very beginning of 1994, the same year that the arcade card would come out. If it uses the card, it's rudimentary at best. I can't tell any difference with or without the card, not even the load times. If you use a System 2.0 card, you get this screen that tells you that it's a Super CD game. This looks like it would probably be a good game though, if the text were translated. I'm not convinced that this game is suitable for this episode, but I included it just in case. If you have any further details, feel free to comment, I'm curious. I remember this next game being really hyped by GameFan, which, if you didn't know, was a magazine over here. Honestly, I'm glad I did not cave into that hype because it's not a very good game. Take a look. Flash Hiders from Right Stuff is another game that uses the arcade card optionally. This is a really not so great one-on-one -on -one fighting game. It mostly just plays itself. Seriously, I'm not touching the controller here at all. What is the point? I had to hunt pretty hard for a mode which actually let me control a fighter against the computer. When you actually do get to play, it uses a Street Fighter style button layout if you're using a six button controller, but everything feels stiff. If you use the arcade card, you get shorter load times between each match, but that's basically it. If you try the System 2.0 card, you get this screen. When it comes down to it, I'd rather control my fighters by choosing cards than actually play this game. Actually, I should be careful what I wish for. Ha! 
Here's Formation Soccer 95 from Human. This is an energetic and fast-paced game of soccer, but you can only choose from teams based in Italy. The gameplay is fine, even if the presentation is a little basic. However, up to four players can play at once. I really do like the intro graphics that flip from screen to screen. The arcade card is optional with this one. If you try to use a System 2.0 card, you'll get this screen telling you to insert a Super CD card. If you use the arcade card, you'll get this loading screen as the game initially boots. After that, there seems to be no loading time at all anywhere. Still, there are only very short load times here and there when using a Super System card. There's not really much more to say about this one. This is Garo Densetsu, otherwise known as Fatal Fury 2. This one-on-one -on -one fighter was of course ported from the Neo Geo by Hudson Soft, and it does a respectable job, mostly. You can play this with a six-button controller or even use a regular controller, but if you do that, the light attacks will default to the select and run buttons. I really don't recommend using a regular controller because this game is going to hand you your ass as it is. That's right, even on easy, this game is absolutely without mercy, even on the very first match of the game. The worst thing about this particular version, though, is how slow it runs. It feels like it's constantly lagging. Of course, if you stick with the game, you will acclimate to everything and eventually start winning, but it'll take longer to do so here than it did in the arcade. Still, besides all that, the conversion is quite good considering the hardware. Many stages have backgrounds that change between rounds, and this happens without any loading, though it's not much more than a simple palette change. Most of the animation of the characters is here, and they even scale down a little bit when jumping back into the screen, which is what this series is known for. However, I'm not a big fan of the black bar behind the player power bars and score. The music is CD quality, which is much better than the arcade, and the sound effects all seem mostly here, though a touch scratchy. If you try to play this one without an arcade card, you get this cool graphic telling you that this is an arcade card exclusive game. I've owned this one for more than a decade now, and while the presentation is absolutely fantastic, it's never really been a favorite to actually play. Here's Garou Densetsu Special, or Fatal Fury Special. This is an updated version of the last game I talked about, if your brain is powerful enough to remember that far back. A few of you do make me wonder. Most of the things that I said about that one can also be applied here, but I'll go over the differences. First, you can now choose from 15 different characters instead of just 8. Those of you who've attended college will know that's almost twice as many. Next, the game balance has been adjusted to be a little bit less ridiculous. I mean, come on, it's an SNK game, so the ridiculous factor will eventually crop up, but this one eases into it much better. This one even has a beginner mode, which I didn't use for recording this footage, I promise. But I would have if I had to. It really seems like they knew that they went a little overboard on the balance with the last one. This one also plays much more smoothly and feels noticeably snappier. That, of course, makes the moves easier to pull off. And, of course, there are new stages to accommodate the new characters, which is always appreciated. Overall, this one is much more enjoyable. It goes without saying that this is the version you want to get if you want to get some Fatal Fury action on your PC engine. Oh, by the way, this is the screen that you get if you try it without the required arcade card. The earlier game is basically just shelf candy since this one exists. Round one. This is Ginga Fukai Densetsu Sapphire from Hudson Saw. This one requires the arcade card. You get this screen telling you to insert the arcade card if you don't have one. Whereas the Duo and the Super CD system cards had Gate of Thunder and later Lords of Thunder as their showcases, this shooter is a showcase for the arcade card. It was also the last game made that took advantage of the arcade card, and legitimate copies of this highly bootlegged game are incredibly rare. This time, we get a vertical shooter instead of a side-scrolling one. It's not part of the Thunder series, as it has an anime style centering around four anime girls and their different ships. Interestingly, when this one started development, it was going to be the third game in the Thunder series, but they added anime girls due to the cartoon series Galaxy Fraulein Yuna being so popular at the time in Japan. I personally don't think that this change made the game any better, but hey, it doesn't make the game bad. Anyway, each girl has her own ship with its own weapons and movement speeds. 
Each ship can collect three different types of unique weapons based on the color of the power-ups. Like almost every other shooter in existence, the green weapon will be the weakest, so I usually don't even bother. You also have a limited number of bombs, and each character shares the same bomb blast effect. Speaking of effects, this title uses the extra ramp to great um, effect. There is tons and tons of pre-rendered animation in each of the stages. If you had shown me this game way back when I first played the TurboGrafx-16, there is absolutely no way that I would have believed that this is the same console. The game is a visual treat, but sometimes it's hard to appreciate the graphics due to the extremely severe flashing that occurs when enemies take damage. It washes out the detail. Less severe flashing would have been appreciated. The game only has five stages, and each of the stages feel perhaps a touch short. There's always at least one mid-boss, though, and some stronger non-boss enemies that you need to get through before you make it to the stage boss. And the stage bosses always have at least two forms. The music is incredible stuff. This game basically exists to show off everything that the console can do. It's not meant to be a deep experience. The gameplay itself is fine, but it's not the most fun you'll ever have, even with a vertical shooter. Regardless of that, it's still 100% worth playing through, though I don't recommend you actually buy it these days, mainly because of the bootlegs and the high prices. Just use whatever means necessary to play this one. Definitely no shame there. Gulliver Boy is next, and it's a fairly decent RPG. You play as Gulliver, and you're a boy. You're sent to Magic Detention School, and your job is to escape and find your friend Edison, who is also a boy. The battles aren't random, as you can see enemies wandering around the map. The battles themselves are pretty typical, though they do have a timer bar, which I've personally never been a huge fan of. There are a lot of voices in this game, and you absolutely cannot skip them. Oh, Gulliver. That's right, you need to hear these voices. It brings the pace of the game down, especially when you can't understand them. In fact, I'm sure I'd be a lot more forgiving if I could understand them. If you play with a version 2.0 system card, you'll get this screen advising you to insert a super system card. Playing with a super system card or arcade card results in absolutely no difference anywhere that I can detect. Well, there is one minor thing. The game is full of full motion video anime cutscenes, which is highly unusual for the console. Without the arcade card, I notice that sometimes the audio will pop or very briefly drop out. With an arcade card, the audio is smooth as butter. That's it, literally the only difference that I noticed. You probably want to play with an arcade card though because there are many video sequences in here. Overall, I feel that this game could be pretty good if it were translated. I wish Working Designs had been able to localize Gulliver Boy, but again, by 1995, that ship had definitely sailed. Oh well, how about some more soccer? Ooh, I don't like that you call it soccer! Yeah, it's dumb, but seriously, who cares? Anyway. Here's J-League Tremendous Soccer 94. This seems to be the previous year's version of Formation Soccer 95. The player graphics are the same, though the field graphics are a little different. The announcer voice is also different, as is the music. It's endorsed by the J-League, and of course that means it's limited to a single country. Insert a System 2.0 card, and you get a fancy graphic telling you that the game is only for the Super CD and Arcade card. And once again, using the Arcade card results in basically no loading at all. However, the initial load is a black screen instead of an Arcade card screen. Nothing more to say here. This one's called Kabuki Ito Ryoden, and it's part of the Far East of Eden franchise. This is a one-on-one -on -one fighting game featuring the characters you know and love. I mean, if you're familiar with the series. 
The arcade card is required and you'll get this screen telling you so if you dare to use it without one. You choose from eight different characters. The game is pretty fun and once again, I highly recommend you use a six button controller if you can. The controls are laid out Street Fighter style with three punches and three kicks. The special moves are also done in a similar manner, just like you'd expect. I'm a little surprised that this one requires an arcade card because it doesn't seem to do anything special with the extra memory. The graphics and animation are pretty good, but certainly nothing mind blowing. There's very little animation in the background. Maybe the amount of voices just barely pushes it over what the Super CD can offer, but I'm guessing there's still a ton of memory that's not being used anywhere. This is certainly not the best example of arcade card software, but it's a decent game nonetheless. This is Linda Cube by NEC. This is an interesting RPG, which I'm sure would be a lot more interesting if I could read it. But hey, that's my problem. The game has an interesting art style for sure, and it seems a bit cyberpunkish. You have three scenarios to choose from, and you can unlock a fourth. They each have certain goals, like needing to get 20 animals or restoring Linda's memory. The main graphics of you exploring are super tiny, but still detailed, and you move at warp speed. If you hold down button two, you can even move at warp three. There are no random battles in this RPG either. The battles here are pretty basic fare, but at least the enemies look good, even if they don't animate and there are no backgrounds. The arcade card is optional here. Playing this back to back with the arcade card and without, I noticed very, very little to no differences. This was a late game on the console and I have a theory that they just put the arcade card logo on the box on these late games as a nod that the game works fine with it. It doesn't necessarily take advantage of it. If you try the System 2.0 card, Linda will tell you in great detail about how you need the proper card. I really hope that this strange game gets a translation sometime. It's also available on the Saturn and the PlayStation. Here's Mad Stalker Full Metal Force. This is a beat em up where you control a mech. I reviewed the Genesis version back in episode 351, New Games for Old Consoles 4. What does this one offer that the other versions don't? Well, now you can select from a few different mechs to play as. It also offers cutscenes between each stage, but usually it's just characters talking, so it's kind of boring and honestly, I just usually skip them. And lastly, it offers music that's the same quality as a CD. The controls are simple. You have a weak and a strong attack and you press up to jump. You can do Street Fighter motions on the D-pad to do a few different special moves. I do feel that both the Genesis and X68000 versions play slightly better, mainly due to the tighter controls. Unfortunately, this version makes no attempt at the parallax scrolling that's in the other versions. As a result, the visuals definitely lose some of their luster. After seeing games like the Thunder series and Sapphire, I know they could have done better here. The music is quite nice, and I prefer it over the MIDI used in the X68000 version. This game uses the arcade card exclusively. If you try it without one, you'll get this screen telling you to go straight to hell. You will occasionally get some hefty loading screens, but as you play, it goes from the stage to the cutscenes to a new stage, and there's basically no loading at all. Still, I think this game could have been done on the Super CD just fine with quick loads between the cutscenes and the stages like most other games on the platform. Overall, it's a good, but kind of a clumsy game. Next up is Mado Monogatari 1 from NEC Avenue. NEC Avenue. Originally from Compile. This is a dungeon crawler starring the Puyo Puyo characters, though this series started first. This is a bit different from the Mega Drive version, which had side view battles. Here, it's turn based and menu driven, though my attacks almost always seem to miss. The animation of the dungeon itself is very poor. Instead of allocating memory to that, they instead use the arcade card space to store lots of voices, which, in my personal opinion, are far less important. Some of them are so quiet you can barely hear them over the music. If you want smooth dungeon animations, you'll have to play a super old game like Fantasy Star on lesser powered hardware. As a game, it's of course a bit confusing if you don't speak the language. 
Almost half of the screen is dedicated to your smiling face, which is basically your life bar. The music is decent and the colors are nice. This game requires the arcade card, and if you don't have it, you get the most simple screen ever telling you to use it. I'd recommend just playing the Mega Drive version instead. Here's Mahjong Sword Princess Quest Gaiden from Naxat. This one starts out with some well-drawn colorful scenes to make it look like you might be in for something fun. Nope, it's Mahjong. You have an overworld map and so-called battles that are actually Mahjong matches. You get damaged each time you lose and that's the only thing I know how to do in Mahjong. Animated cutscenes play out and naturally the losers lose their clothes because what else do you expect? The arcade card is optional and you get a voiced and rather long-winded explanation about everything if you try to system 2.0 card. I honestly can't tell what the arcade card offers over the Super CD version. The loading time to the animations where you lose your clothes is longer with the arcade card, but the animation doesn't seem any better. Oh well, who cares, it's Mahjong. Dumb. Hey look, it's Potful Mail, one of my favorite CD games. Well, at least on the Sega CD. In this version, everything is a lot smaller. Tiny, in fact. The method of attack is also quite different. You no longer press a button to swing your sword. That's right, this one has bump fighting mechanics like Falcom's other game, which you may have heard of, called Ys. But here, you need to be in the air to harm enemies. You can jump and land on them like Mario, or you can hurt them as you're jumping up and floating down. It takes a bit to get used to, especially when you're used to fighting these bosses in a completely different way coming from the Sega CD version. You still do have an attack button, though, for throwing weapons and other projectile attacks. While nothing here can compete with the Sega CD game, it's still a treat to play and see the similarities and differences. This one seems to have almost as much voice as the Sega version, maybe more. Oh, check it out, scrolling clouds. How about that? Victor Ireland would be proud. Unfortunately, this is about all the parallax you're gonna get here. The arcade card is once again optional here. If you use an early card, Mail will tell you to turn the system off and insert a better card. As for the differences in using the arcade card versus the regular Super CD, well, it's not much at all. It takes a few seconds longer for the arcade card to load initially, but you won't need to stop and load during the opening segment, meaning you'll get to the title screen a couple of seconds faster. That's pretty intense. And that's the case throughout the game. The cutscenes need to load less, getting you back to the game faster. There aren't any other differences that are noticeable. Still, I find it interesting to play this one. This is Princess Maker 2 from Micro Cabin. It appears you lead the life of a princess in this dreadfully boring text adventure. Well, actually, it's more of a princess simulator than an adventure. I'd rather play a coma simulator. If you have a System 2 card, you get this screen, which is more exciting than anything in the game proper. If you use the optional arcade card, you'll get this extra loading screen in the beginning, meaning there are shorter load times during the game. That's all, moving on. This one is called Private Idol and it's from NEC. This one is basically a text adventure game, but you can move your character sprites around like an RPG. I like how one of the options in the game is turning breast enhancements on or off. The gameplay is fairly smooth, though it's easy to repeat conversations if you try to cycle through them too fast. Thankfully, the voices can be skipped, even disabled. And you guessed it, the arcade card is optional, and if you use it, you'll get this extra loading screen, which means shorter loads here and there throughout the game. You'll get this explaining that your System 2.0 card is definitely the wrong card if you try to use that one. Not a whole lot else here, really. There is a translation that I'd like to try sometime, though. Ah yes, Quest of Jong Master, also known as Janshin Densetsu. This is a port of a Neo Geo game. This one tries to pretend that it's something almost good by having an RPG-like mode where you wander around and talk to people. But no, it's just Mahjong, again. And of course, if you don't win, you lose your clothes. What else do you expect from Mahjong? I mean, that's part of the official rules. 
The arcade card is required for this turd. I couldn't tell you why, as there's nothing special about it. But if you don't have one, they get really, really upset about it. I can't really say that it's better or worse than the Neo Geo version. Boring. This one is called Ryuko no Ken, known as Art of Fighting in the West. This is a port of the fighting game from the Neo Geo. And a damn good port it is, all things considered. The fighters are all very large, and they each have most, if not all, of their animation from the Neo Geo game. That's probably why the arcade card is required for this one. The game also tries to mimic the arcade scaling when you and your opponent move further away from each other. It does this by quickly changing the output resolution the game is running at. A bit distracting and jarring at first, yes, but technically pretty awesome. I kind of have a love-hate relationship with this title. If you try to play it like Street Fighter, you will get absolutely wrecked. But once you acclimate, it becomes fun and, dare I say, easy. Even with that though, the last boss will still put you in your place until you figure him out. The six button controller is thankfully supported. If you try to play without an arcade card, you get this little drama that informs you how to use it. However, if you reset the console after it's over and watch it again, you'll get a mini game after the third time it plays called Daikon Cut. That's right, a secret mini game. Here, you need to win at the slot machines to make him slice the green tops off of the vegetables. If you don't match all three, he'll just knock some of the Daikons away. This seems to go on forever. It's kind of cool that they sometimes hide things like this, and that's why I'm telling you what every single one of these games do when you don't have the right card in there. Overall, this certainly isn't the best fighting game in the world, but it's an impressive one, and the arcade card really helps it push the console. It absolutely could not be done without the card. There are two things that I learned that Japanese gamers absolutely love. The first, of course, is Mahjong games. The second is also Mahjong games. Here we have sexy idol Mahjong fashion Monogatari from Nichibutsu. This one has you roll the dice and move around on the board to find an opponent. The matches feature digitized graphics of real girls. I'm not able to win, so I don't know if they lose their clothes if you beat them, but come on, they probably do. You get this extra loading screen at the start if you use the optional arcade card. This results in ever so slightly less loading times during the game. And this screen telling you to use at least a System 3 card if you try using an older card. Okay, I'm done with this one. This is Shin Nippon Pro Wrestling 94 Battlefield in Tokyo Dome. This one requires the arcade card. If you don't have one, this guy suggests asking your mom and dad to buy one for you. The game itself is rather primitive. I'm not good at wrestling games, and this one feels like most of the other ones I've played, meaning that it feels like my controller isn't plugged in. I know it's just me, but I kind of like feeling that my button presses matter. I'm weird, I know. The only thing I can see the arcade card being used for is the rather long intro where it shows lots and lots of digitized pictures of all the real wrestlers that are in the game. The in-game graphics are extremely bland, probably not even using 64 kilobits of the over 18,000 kilobits of memory available. I'm gonna have to give this one a hard pass, but hey, maybe you'd like it. This one is called Satsugyo 2 Neo Generation, and it's by Riverhill Soft. This is a game based around a bunch of anime girls. Surprise, surprise. Anyway, this one is a classroom simulator where you need to choose their classes, make sure that they learn a lot, and also make sure that they don't get into trouble. Who gets home from school and wants to play a game about school? Anyway, if your system card is too old, you're told to use a system three card or later, and that you probably already know that. You get an extra loading screen when you use the arcade card, but there's really not any noticeable differences otherwise. Next, please. I might as well mention Space Ava 201 from Nicole Express. This is a homebrew game that was released in 2020 and it was made entirely by one person. Basically, you move around one step at a time and the game map and enemies also move once when you move. You need to make sure to get the orbs and not run into the enemies or obstacles. 
There are even boss fights like this one where you need to lead them into stage obstacles several times. Then I get to this part and I have no clue what's going on. None of the buttons seem to do anything and I can't get past it. This one uses the arcade card to help reduce loading times. You'll get this screen if you have the card. If you have a System 2.0 card, you're threatened with jail time. Eh, that seems appropriate. The game even takes advantage of the super graphics if you have one. For example, you'll get scrolling stars in this scene if you do have super graphics and just a black screen if you don't. Oh hey look, I figured out what to do in this scene. Anyway, since it does use the arcade card, I figured I'd include it in this episode for completeness' sake. And here we have Strider Hero, converted by NEC Avenue. This one requires the arcade card. If you don't have it, you get a funny comic about the memory not being enough and Strider being defeated. Unfortunately for everyone, this is probably one of the worst conversions of Strider ever. Right away, you notice the extremely dark and ugly colors that attempt to give life to the poorly drawn artwork. You'll also notice that the controls are stiff and not at all fluid like the arcade original. One thing you might not notice sometimes is Strider himself. Why is that, you ask? Because he completely disappears in the flicker. That's right, gone. Just completely missing. But make no mistake, you can still take damage during this. Keep in mind that the Genesis version, which came out four years earlier, is 8 megabits, and this game can load 18 megabits in a single level, which is over twice the size of a Genesis game. But no, instead they use the extra storage space so that the mid-bosses and stage bosses can monologue with extremely quiet voices. They add absolutely nothing of value, and in fact they detract from it since the quality and volume are so low. My theory is that by the time this game was made, most of the good programmers had moved on from the PC Engine. We do get cutscenes between each level and some decently arranged music though. We also get an optional new level. Heck, maybe the programmers just wanted to work on a Mahjong game instead. Speak of the Devil, it's Super Real Mahjong P2 and 3 Custom from Naxat. Apparently, it's impossible to have too many Mahjong games. Do the girls take off their clothes if they lose? Well, what do you think? You get this screen with them going on in great detail how you need a better system card if you try to run it with a System 2.0 card. The arcade card is optional, and I can't tell the difference between having one and not having one. Also, this game is not even slightly real, much less super real. And here's Super Real Mahjong P5 Custom. Holy crap, guys, check it out, it's Mahjong! I don't know why Super Real Mahjong Part 4 doesn't use the arcade card, and I don't really care. You get a similar screen as the last game if you try to use the System 2.0 card. The arcade card is optional, and once again, there seems to be no difference at all, not even loading times. Okay, thank God, we're finally done with Mahjong games for this episode. This one is called Tanjo Debut and is from NEC Avenue. Yep, another game based around a group of high school anime girls. These girls want to be pop idols and you have to take care of their day-to-day -day business it seems. Nothing much interesting here. The arcade card is optional and you get this extra loading screen when you use it. That probably means there's less loading at some points in the game, but I haven't noticed. And you get this screen if you use a System 2.0 card telling you to use a Super CD card. This is another snore fest for most Western gamers. Aha, Vastille 2 from Human. I've been wanting to try this one out. This is a hexagonal strategy game. The first one actually came out in North America thanks to working designs. This one is fairly easy to pick up thanks to the basic menu on the right being in English. This one can use the mouse, a turbo tap for multiple players, and a memory base 128. The battles are different than the first game in that they play out like any other strategy RPG when two opposing forces meet to fight. The first game had you manually controlling your unit around the stage during a battle. This one is hard to win because you miss all the time, but the enemy never seems to. Still, at least the music is more appropriate this time out. 
This one's still pretty fun, but it does make short work of newbies. The arcade card is optional, and if you use it, it supposedly adds some extra PCM sound effects, but that rumor must be false because the game sounds exactly the same both ways. You do get this exciting extra loading screen, though. If you use a System 2.0 card, you get this screen mostly in English, which is similar to the normal boot-up sequence, except that it fails when it detects the System 2 card. Overall, this seems like a good game once you get past the initial curve. This is World Heroes 2. This is a one-on-one -on -one fighting game that's a port of the Neo Geo version. I don't like the Neo Geo game at all, and I don't like this one. So at least it's somewhat faithful if World Heroes 2 is something that you desire. It does take advantage of a six button controller, but you only have three buttons to worry about, punch, kick, and throw. The graphics here are faithful, but they were never too spectacular to begin with. The color mostly holds up pretty well. Some of the stages even have line scrolling floors, but not all of them. The quality of the voice is as good as far as digitization goes, and that's probably where a lot of the memory went. The CD music is pretty good, and it helps elevate it a touch over the original, at least in that regard. <laughs> this one requires the arcade card, and you'll see this screen if you forgot to use it. If you like World Heroes, then you might appreciate this port. <laughs> Here's Wrestle Angels Double Impact from NEC. This is a wrestling game that's card based? That's right, they found a way to make me like a wrestling game even less. Choose your moves based on the card sets and watch them play out. The arcade card is optional and it seems to make absolutely no discernible difference that I can see. Using a System 2.0 card tells you to insert a Super CD or an arcade card. Even with the luck of the draw, I still can't win a match. In fact, I'm not even sure which girl I am. I think I'm the one on the bottom of the screen. Oh well, it doesn't matter, I'm bored. Finally, we have Wrestling Universe Fire Pro Women from Human. Yep, another wrestling game, and this one is part of the beloved Fire Pro series. They're known for their isometric view. This one requires the arcade card, and you get this screen if you don't have it. I'm still not able to control things very well here. I guess I'm just too used to traditional fighting games. Still, this is better than using cars to determine what happens. Although the graphics are quite simple, lack detail, and the animation seems choppy, there are actually a lot of different animation frames. It's just that they're not particularly smooth. A lot of people love this series though, and if you're one of the fans, you'll likely enjoy this title. One thing that I definitely like about this one is the music. It has absolutely no right to be this good in a wrestling game. And there you go, every single game that's compatible with the arcade card. And maybe one that's not? Is it possible that I missed any? I do think it's better to use the arcade card than not in games that are compatible, but overall it really doesn't make a huge difference. In fact, only 3x3i seem to put any real effort into its dual compatibility. Anyway, what do you guys think of the arcade card? Let me know, and in the meantime, thank you for watching GameSack. I'm Neo Geo. Well, I'm not literally the Neo Geo. I'm a human representing the Neo Geo. But for this episode, I'm Neo Geo. And I'm PC Engine. This, this is, is Console, Console Combat! Combat! I feel we could have been in a little bit better sync on that one. Wow, suddenly I was just thinking for literally no reason whatsoever that I like to look at art in museums. You're a pansy. Me? I like to fight. Wow, that reminds me of a video game. What could it be?
I know, it reminds me of Art of Fighting for the, you know, PC Engine Arcade Card CD. Yeah, but it was better on the Neo Geo. Come on, that's Art of Fighting 2. Well, that's because this is the only one I have physically, but Art of Fighting on the Neo Geo is still better. What? That's it? Are we doing this? Do I always ask esoteric yet rhetorical questions where the answer hints at yes? Um, I don't know. The answer is yes. Yes, I do. We are doing this. Best Art of Fighting. Art of Fighting was originally released in the arcades on the Neo Geo hardware in 1992. It was ported to lots of different consoles, but today we only care about the PC Engine CD port. Which one's better? Let's find out. The graphics in both versions are pretty much identical. But no, they're not. I'm the Neo Geo. For having the best graphics, best graphics goes to Neo Geo. Our presentations are almost identical. Yeah, except mine doesn't have any loading times. For not sucking ass, best presentation goes to Neo Geo. Our sounds are similar. Yeah, but lest you forget, I am the Neo Geo. You can't win this one. Um, yes I can. Because my game is on CD, it has way better music and it's been arranged from the original. Listen to the difference. Now listen to how awesome the PC Engine CD sounds. Yeah, so much better. Yeah, but mine has better sound effects. Your sound effects need to be compressed to fit in a pathetic amount of memory for your stupid idiot console. Just listen to the hits and the battle voices. Now listen to the Neo Geo sound effects. Yeah, but mine still aren't bad. The sound effects themselves might be edged out slightly by the Neo Geo, but better music means best sound goes to the PC Engine Arcade Card CD. Our gameplay is identical. Aw, oh, shut up! That fake scaling, snapping back and forth makes your game almost completely unplayable. Plus, mine plays like the arcade because it is the arcade. So, tie then? Uh, how about I tie your legs to a cement block and throw you into Stone Harbor? But my game has a Dijon Cup minigame. No minigame on the Neo Geo. You're serious. Of course I'm serious. I mean, can't you tell by my hair, and my eyebrows, and my lack of beard? For being a real hot dog instead of a weenie, best gameplay goes to Neo Geo! <laughs> Both games are Art of Fighting, but only one of them matter, and that game is Art of Fighting for the Neo Geo. And Art of Fighting 2, I guess. <laughs>